Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this uh, talk today on Tactile Visions Woven. We have uh, three of the artists from the exhibition here with us today, Mary Sabande, Vladimir de Villiers, and Reshma Chiba. Uh, thank you very much to the artists for making themselves available today and for making their works available for the exhibition. Um, I can't tell you what an honor it is to work with all of you. Um, you know, um, I've been I've been really looking forward to this dialogue uh, today, uh, not just because of your amazing works, um, but you know, after curating the exhibition, I, I had uh, Zoom chats with each of you, and they were just supposed to be ten minutes. Uh, <laughs> they didn't really last. 10 minutes with everyone. Some people spoke with 25 minutes. Um, but, but it became clear that despite each of your uh, very, very uh, you know, different cultural backgrounds, there were different um, threads, uh, very similar threads that were running throughout each of your works. And, and in today's dialogue, I, I really want to explore some of those threads that are running through your work. Um, and so, you know, uh, let's just jump right into it. Um, each of you has, has really extensive bodies of work um, and around te textile-based media. And um, so I want, I want to use that as a starting point for this conversation today uh, and the kinds of everyday materialities that you'll use in your work. Uh, Mary, you started off, uh, you know, Sophie and um, the kinds of, you know, the codings that that we that we we read in in Sophie's garments that that were around domestic work, uh, the 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 duke, the white maid, a, the apron, um, and the everyday pa paraphernalia that was associated with households, um, and then it quickly became so much more elaborate than that. Um, Villamine, you employ domestic textiles, as you call them, and um, you know, the, this use of tea, tea trays. Um, Reshma, you use saris um, as, as canvases and in, in your work, and the ways in which you cut up various cloths as well in order to make the sculptures. Um, so, I, I want each of you to still sort of start to talk about um, the, the evolution of, of these everyday materialities in your work. And, and as you're, you're, you're discussing the, the, these, these works and these starting points in your works, I'm, I'm going to start showing some of these uh, early works of yours. So Mary, maybe if you want to start. Um, it's, it's actually quite funny uh, and at the same time quite humbling when I look at the bodies of work that I've created so far uh, from 2008 when I was doing uh, uh, my honours degree at UJ up to this day. Um, and it started um, with me, well, it started, I started with a simple um, concept. I wanted to celebrate the women in my family who were all domestic workers. Um, in a way, I, when, I, when I was studying out, I, I, I said in my head, you know, writers write, uh, but I'm not a writer, I'm a visual artist. How do I create uh, uh, visual stories out of, out of this story that I have, that, I'm, that, I have, that I've been collecting from, from my grandmother, uh, from, my, from my mother? And from there, um, I came up with this idea of a domestic worker. Um, so initially, it was supposed to be my grandmother. So I had this idea that I'll get my grandmother to dress up and I'll take photographs of her. But then halfway through that idea, I was like, hold on, no, 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 it won't seem right. It actually, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well with me because these women for generations, they've been working, they've been actually putting in without, without getting, with sometimes getting a little out. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I thought, well, it would be actually great or it makes sense that I should be the storyteller 
and they act at the same time. It's kind of like Quentin Tarantino where he acts in his own movies. <laughs> um, so it started all day and, um, and I've created dresses. And for me, it was just um, the love of fabric. And it's because at some point when I was in high school, I wanted to be a fashion designer. And yeah, so I was just going back and just creating uh, uh, dresses, but not your typical uh, domestic worker dresses. I wanted to take take them to the next level, and of course, tell a story in 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 in, in those kind of in, in in the fabrics. And from there, it became a color, and I changed and all the bodies of work. And every four years, I have to change the color. Um, so it has been. It's it's like every time when I make. The, the bodies of work, the next step seems clearer. And and funny enough, I know what I'm going to make in two years, which is funny. So the work has actually been giving, so been giving and to a point where I, I just don't know where it comes from. It's just, yeah, just a surprise to myself as well. Um, for me, the domestic milieu is, is is incredibly inspiring, and um, because it it does hold, I think you said that in your previous talk, Charlene, it holds great potential for love and great potential for violence. Um, it is um, it's, it's a conflicting milieu, and I grew up with tensions around domesticity. I think my mother resisted and resented it, and yet bought into it completely. So I grew up in a household where if you prepare tea for somebody, there's a there's a tea tray cloth. It can't be stained. It can't be it can't look like it was ever used. Um, and of course a great deal of work, especially my grandmother, spent hours embroidering, embroidering to perfection. I think her perfectionism was almost a psychosis. Um, um, and and I, as an observer, as a child, could feel this this discomfort, this incredible discomfort around this superficial perfection, knowing that the family isn't perfect, that that's just that's just an image, that's just a little layer. So um, when I finally, in my art practice, reconnected straight back to to those cloths and the stained ones, and I started asking people to send me the stained cloths and the torn cloths. It was incredibly liberating to start tearing into them and to abuse them and to um, start telling a different story. So so that's my, my base connection with, with what I work with. Yeah, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so for me, um, I mean, my practice, uh, my starting point has always been my maternal grandmother um, and the goddess Kali. Um, and many years ago, um, I started researching this and researching mythology around Kali just because I'm interested in it, also because of my long sort of dance history uh, and interest in mythology there. And I started off with... Um, abstracted paintings, uh, in fact, different to what you're showing now. Um, and they the sort of daily, everyday substance that I was using was non-traditional painting media. So crushed coal, ash, turmeric, kumkumum, all these kinds of things that relate to earth, relate to goddess, relate to ritual practices around goddess. Um, and then, uh, you know, for me, all of this was around the idea of a defiant womanhood. And Kali started to present this space of defiance in relation to womanhood. Uh, but in in this in the, at this moment, I was thinking about womanhood in relation to the specificity of my ancestry. And so the sari became, uh, you know, the immediate choice. Uh, in terms of material. And initially I started wrapping and binding these and thread was always a constant uh, material that was used. Um, this idea of penetrating the surface was important for me. Uh, the penetration being almost a, a violent act, uh, but also a disruption of what we think of as women's work, right? Um, but then the saris also become the canvas. You know, the sari is the thing that is supposed to conceal. 
to hide women's bodies. Uh, and so these naked goddesses, uh, often in compu copulation uh, with the male god on these canvases, uh, start to speak about revealing and concealing how we how we present our bodies, how as women we are always taught to close instead of open. Um, and so the, these goddesses start to counter that. And then the thread uh, itself, um, as a medium that has always been present. Uh, I then started to think about how does that translate into a more three-dimensional three uh, material. So then I started using uh, cord, nylon cord, to make the sculptures. Um, and then from there moved on to starting to cut up fabric and think about binding and knotting and yeah. So mm. that's a, a brief overview. <laughs> Hope mm. that answers the question. Yeah, you know, when we're talking about women's histories, of course, um, the issue of binding and knotting is a very complicated one. And, you know, in sewing itself, that, that metaphor of binding and knotting and piercing and poking is, is, is in itself uh, uh, quite telling. Um, I, 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 I said it in the earlier talk, and, and, and Reshma, I, I've also, you know, uh, thought about this even in terms of your work I've also you know it, it's always struck me around you know this this thing of of the you know the when, when I read even when I when I was when I was younger and I and I um, read these Jane Austen novels and you'd have these women in this Victorian setting uh, quietly sewing there while while their fates were being you know discussed in front of them and you know like wanted to shake the living daylights out of them. Um, it's that violence, right? That that metaphor of that poking mm. and stabbing that cloth. And, and, I, and mm. I think about all of you sitting in your studios doing these <laughs> acts, <laughs> uh, which is quite violent. And then these incredible works emerging out of them. Um, but my next, my next question to you, uh, Osim, is in each of your works, you know, histories and storytelling, uh, storytelling plays an, an incredibly important role. And, um, you know, Willamine with your tea trays, this idea of, of things being stained and broken, uh, the qualities um, hinting at the fact that they come with these histories. Um, these what you've said are previous lives and the importance of that um, and, and that forming the canvas for the narratives that you place on top of that. And, and Tanya Peterson also spoke about that uh, in, 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 in her work as well. Um, Mary, in, in your recent uh, work with, with Yasuke, you know, Sophie becomes um, and your body becomes an avatar for other African narratives, which is, which is you know, so incredibly important, you know, when we don't have a, a necessarily an, an, an image of an African a samurai and then your body standing in for that, of what potency that is. Um, and, and then Reshma, you know, you engaging your own ancestral history and language through this motive and energy that is Kali. Um, could, could, could you start speaking to some of these things? Maybe we'll start with you, Philemon. Yes, um, the, the the staining is 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 very important to me. Um, I think partly because uh, women are the way I see it, so responsible for um, removing stains. You know, they they are the stain removers. They must they must make sure that whatever stain, metaphorical and literal, is there, um, they must help remove it and, and make nice and smooth. And I think most women can identify with probably the shame around stains as well. For us, huh. the first stain is probably the menstrual stain that you discover unexpectedly. Mm. And and it, it's it's doesn't matter how well you, if you were lucky enough to have a mother or a sister or a friend who prepared you for that, it's still somehow shameful. I don't understand why. Mm. And you, 
you're not going to run outside with your panty and say to everybody, oh, look what's <laughs> happened. You know, you are, you are most likely, um, like what I did, roll it in the tiniest little ball and knot it and hide it because it is shameful. Um, and I think from there on, there are many, many stains that become a, a, a difficult relationship. So now I deliberately stain things. Um, and I, I, I say, if I find... Or if somebody gifts me a beautiful cloth full of stains, um, they talk to me deeply, and I know what story to tell. Um, in the in the bride series, it very um, specifically came out um, because that tablecloth I was gifted that that gave the whole bride series to me was a 120 year old tablecloth belonging to a missionary's wife in what is now the Northwest province, but she came out from Germany to marry her fiance. And um, and that was the tablecloth that she used and stained and mended and mended again. And it was so full of devotion. It was a devotional piece to me, almost like an altar cloth. Um, uh, so, and then the word bride came in. But anyway, I'll speak about the brides later, maybe. It's... Um, it, it stains come with a story that I that that moved me deeply. And and it's so interesting you saying that because the, the the fundamental contradiction here is that in some cultures, of course, that the staining, the on the one hand, you know, the shaming of 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 women's menstrual blood when we stain things and how we need to hide that, but then the the act of oh here you are on your you need the on your wedding night here's proof you of, need that stain like, yes yes and yeah. how women have had to fake the staining you know I know, I, know. Right? I don't yeah. do you know Corin Blixen's lovely story about the white sheet or the yeah. white so it's a beautiful beautiful story where where the nuns there was a nunnery, I mean, I'm paraphrasing horribly and I haven't read it for a while, but a nunnery whose sole job it was to weave sheets for brides to use. And then it would go down to the village. And then after the wedding night, the sheets would come back and they would display them in a massive hall. <laughs> and all the nuns would walk and look. But the sheets in front of which they stood for the longest were the ones that came back with no stain. And that to me was so powerful and so moving um, because of, yes, what does the sheet with no stain say? Um, anyway, yeah, you are quite right. Yeah, that is a stain that's always celebrated in certain, yeah. Mary? Um, actually, what I what I what I what I've picked up so far with our works, the three of us, there's a thread that runs through, and I can see that the color of it is red, yeah. and, and all three of us are drawing inspiration from our four pieces, um, and and there's there's a term that I uh, that I picked up in all our in all our works um, that is violence, oh. and. And so that there is, a, there is that interconnection that yet we come from different backgrounds. And of course, in South Africa, uh, we we are aware of our colors, meaning we are aware of our races. And of course, our races um, um, influence what we are or, or, or how, we, how we view the world somehow, you know, even if, whether you can say you're educated or you've been traveling the world. Um, and, and, and I also um, realized that it's that, 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 that the term is, yeah, that violence is actually, you know, that thread that has, that, that, that is running through our works. And, and I think in a way it speaks of South Africa, like um, that we all have different backgrounds. Um, we all for coming from uh, different races, but there's that term that, 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 um, that that is um, that is in, that, that is engaging us today, and that is violence. And of course, when one is watching the news, the news are just so blue. They're just so depressing. Like women being killed. And, mm. and, and, um, so it's actually quite um, uh, uh, amazing that um, there is that uh, thread that runs through. And of course, stories um, are a way we explore what it means to be human. And 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 us. Uh, 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 making the, these bodies of works are a way of us telling um, uh, 
um, uh, our individual story, but at the same time, these stories are actually universal. They all link us, they bind us together. And I think that's what's also an interesting way. Mm. Mm. Do you want to tell us a little bit um, about Yasuke? Oh, um, so a few years ago, uh, I stumbled upon this a story of the African samurai Yasuke, um, who lived in Japan in about 400 years ago. And for me, it, that, that story uh, um, got me interested in that from what I know, from what history has been telling me, history has told me that Africans were static. Africans will actually move around to find Graceland, but actually pe people have been moving to other continents. And in a way, um, I started questioning history, like who's writing history? And why are we not writing our own history? Because of course, if we write our own history, we'll tell the story the way we want to be, to be known in the future. So this story, the, the story of Yasuke, um, I kind of, uh, kind of weaved it into my, into my body of work. Um, and of course, uh, now Sophie has taken an, uh, an avatar of, of, of this um, samurai. And, um, and in, in, in a way, um, my stories are, I, I guess, a cut and paste of, 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 from history. Uh, I, I borrow from, 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 uh, from movies or uh, from books or from other artists. And um, so the story of, of this work, um, it's just tremendous that we actually have been moving. It's just that history has not been telling uh, our story in, in our favor. Um, and this work is, um, um, it's, it, it comes from uh, the current body of work, the Red series, uh, which is titled, I Came Apart at the Seams. So I Came Apart at the Seams, I, I, I wanted to explore violence. I wanted to talk about um, uh, uh, the other parts of South Africa other parts of change um, and of course change has been known that change is a violent process it's never an easy uh, walk in the park uh, kind of process uh, so for me when I thought of violence I thought of um, what well, what uh, what metaphors can I think of um, that speaks of this and um, I came across this the saying in Isuzulu when someone is angry they're angry they've become a red dog so I started making uh, 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 these life-size dogs of Staffordshire Cook Terriers, but now they're actually not stuffies anymore. They are hellhounds, and they're all red, blood red. And um, and this uh, and uh, going back to this, the samurai, um, the samurai is holding a a a uh, a heart, and he's playing it like a yo-yo. So also in in Guni. Um, the, the heart is a locus, is a locus for anger. So it's a place where anger resides. Of course, in, 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 in other ways, it will explode and burst at the seams. Mm -hmm. So well, I, don't, I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, yeah. I heard that Yasuke, um, Chadwick Boseman was supposed to have played the character of Yasuke. And I, I've just been devastated to hear today that he passed mm. away. And it's yeah. like, okay, just just giving a shout out to Chadwick Boseman, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Black Panther, um, and all that that represented for us, you know, in the last few years as well. Um, mm. Because we, we know what, you know, that kind of Black representation means for us. Mm. Um, uh, and, and I'll never forgive Avengers for not putting uh, Black Panther in the end game. So, okay, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Reshma? <laughs> um, yeah, okay. <laughs> that was a sign. <laughs> Punctuations along the way. Um, uh, no, I think, you know, uh, just thinking about what uh, both um, Mary and Wilhelmina have been saying, I think the one thing, it's not just violence um, and rage, but it's also this idea of how uh, in some cases uh, you know women sometimes are also responsible for how they are the upholders of patriarchy and i think you know i think of those white sheets and nuns looking at this um, these are women looking at it you know and having uh, having expectations on other women and this kind of policing of women's bodies 
also happens by women, you know. But that's also just a, sorry, that was a punctuation. But to answer your question, Charlene, um, about my own ancestral history and my uh, interest in storytelling, um, I mean, you know, like I said, I'm a dancer, so storytelling is is part of what I do as a as a kind of performance. And like I said before we came live, I would have rather used my hands instead of my speaking voice here uh, because it's something I'm more comfortable with. Uh, but I've been so I've been interested in in mythologies and in particular mythologies um, that are related to goddess uh, and goddess from Hindu mythology specifically. Um, but then I'm also interested in my own uh, personal ancestry. Uh, and so like I've, my mother is like, she, 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 every time I bring up my grandmother, she knows it's gonna be like a long conversation of, you know, what story can I tell her today? Um, and, uh, and it's interesting because even in this period of lockdown, uh, there's been so much about her life that I've been learning that I didn't know about. So that's, that, that idea of learning about oneself and the women who have come before, for me, that's really important, but it's also ongoing, right? Um, and then Kali, you know, I think about this, my grandmother and like she, you know, she was a, a young woman who traveled on a ship uh, with a seven year old boy in the 1950s alone, can't speak the language. I mean, you trust that the telegraph got there and someone's gonna fetch you. How do, I mean, what do they, how do they have this kind of uh, strength and like, you know, this, this belief in something and in themselves, right? Um, and so for me, it's also recognizing that that is within us in some ways. Um, and so I was thinking about their lives and the, the, the lives of the women at that time and also the kind of different kinds of violences they may have faced, but also the, the patriarchal difficulties. And so Kali then starts to present as the defiant voice, the possibility, the other possibility of womanhood that we could be. Uh, and more and more, I've then been interested in this question of how do I myself start to think through the embodiment of Kali. Um, so whether that embodiment happens through dance or through uh, a photographic work uh, or through even the like the failure, right? I'm interested in failure also as a mechanism of just uh, not fully uh, being able to become Kali. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting in relation to Mary, Mar Mary's work and Sophie and how Sophie takes on you know, these many characters. Uh, for me, like Kali becomes the character that I try to take on, that I try to embody. Uh, and I and there's an element of failure in the inability to become uh, or the con or being in a constant state of becoming uh, that I'm interested in. Um, yeah, and then storytelling also manifests uh, through the photographic works, like the work that you're showing now that comes out of the Dashamaha Vidya series, which literally translates as the 10 transcendental wisdoms. Uh, so there's the 10 transcendental wisdoms of goddess. Um, and in, in this series, the dancer that I work with, Anusha Pele, who I've been photographing since like 2004, uh, you know, so she also becomes like a collaborator in the making. Um, so here the goddess takes on many variations from sort of nurturing to destructive to here specifically she's relating to uh, the idea of knowledge and knowledge production and goddess who resides over art. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot, lot of moments of both storytelling and then a looking back at oneself and a searching of this ancestry and history um, that I'm trying to find my way through. So, so let me have a few uh, follow-up questions for you. Um, in terms of, is it a tongue? Is it a clip? What is it exactly? And um, you know, uh, you're 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 a dancer, and you're a dance teacher, Bharatanatyam dance teacher. You have your own school, um, and. I'm wondering for people who are not spiritual, right? Who who hear about this, um, this you know, people who think uh, like, well, all this energy, spiritual stuff is all frou frou stuff. Uh, how how do you how do you harness something that's Kali energy to fight patriarchy on a daily basis? Okay. 
So I'm going to answer your first question, and then I'm going to try and answer your second question. Emphasis on the word try. So <laughs> the first part of your question around the tongue, it's a tongue. Uh, but the multiplicity of meaning or what it could be is deliberate. Um, the fact that it hangs in this specific work here, the fact that it hangs from a woman's body around her waist, it becomes an exaggerated clitoris. It's also riffing off a, a theater style, a folk theater style called Mutietu, which is a dance style, a folk theater style of in from Kerala. So, and here it's about the evocation and invocation of Kali, only performed by men. So the 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 disruption here is that it's a woman play a woman dancing here. The men who wear this, obviously, when they wear this tongue hanging from their waist, becomes a phallic object. When they hang from the wall or they protrude from the wall, they interrupt the space. They they become almost phallic-like. They also become mistaken for a woman bending over and you seeing her legs. There's multiplicity in meaning. So the starting point is a tongue, but it can speak speak to many things, right? And I use the word speak deliber deliberately as well. Um, so it's, it's either a tongue, it's a clit, it's a phallus, it's all of those things. Um, I think it also then starts to blur the lines of gender and of binary. Um, that is both and, not an either or. Then, what was your second question again? How do we, how do, how oh, do you right. harness the spiritual in to deal with every day? So Touch I'm, that. I'm interested in both the physical and the transcendent, um, the mythological and the real. So there's a, there's a strong use of irony. I mean, when I say embody Kali. I try to become Kali in that one photograph. And but there's a failure in that. There's a failure in trying to be Kali because if Kali were real, I mean not that Kali is not real, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean if Kali were able to come down and like wipe out patriarchy, then we wouldn't be sitting here with the shit of gender based violence and all the other kinds of violences we're sitting with, right? That's that's the one truth. The other thing is when I perform when I'm on stage, there's a very different experience of Kali that I have. I physically feel another kind of energy come over me. Whatever that energy is, you want to call it God, you want to call it source, you want to call it universal energy, you want to call it Kali, whatever it is. That is an experiential thing for me. That sometimes the audience feels. And I just, I, I don't think it's about I can say that this is Kali and this is how she's disrupting the patriarchy. The one thing I can say is it is also in how we use our own speaking voices. It is in how we choose to wear our bodies, how we choose to wear our hair. You know, hair is in Indian culture, hair is tied to sexuality. So the unbound wild hair starts to become seen as something, you know, this is not accepted. You must tie your hair after six o'clock because God forbid what will happen to you. Um, so all of those kinds of rules around how we wear our hair become, yes, <laughs> Kali, <laughs> becomes a way, to, a way to defy mm -hmm. that, right, um, to defy the patriarchy. So how one chooses to be in one's own body and harness a kind of Kali-esque um, way of presenting, I think, is one of the ways I think about it. I don't know if that answers your question. No, thank you for that. Um, so, you know, uh, firstly, thank you to, to Mary. She basically asked, uh, all three of my next questions by, uh, <laughs> by highlighting the violence, the red and the maternal. Um, so I have to find other questions to ask you. Uh, <laughs> Mary. Uh, <clears throat> But I, 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 but I mean, I want to go to, um, I, want to I do want to follow the bloodlines uh, that, that, that Mary uh, highlighted in, from, from Reshma's work into your work, um, and, and particularly into the Bride series. Uh, because you, you, you know, the Tactile Visions has a few of your bride works, and and so I, I, I want to discuss what are the nuances between the different bride works. You have, we have the the bride 
uh, child brides, subversive bride. I don't know how many more bride works there are, but but can you take us through that that bride series that you have while I bring up some of those works on screen? Um, the, the the bride series, as I said, in a way, came to me as a as a as an absolute gift, literally in the form of this tablecloth. Um, and just this particular bride's journey from Germany um, really, uh, it, it, it just moved me. And what I sometimes do um, and like to do is to throw out a question to my um, Instagram community, which is a lovely, wonderful, um, supportive and hugely creative community. And I just ask the question, what does the word bride mean to you? Because I wondered why it's so much more loaded than the word bridegroom, for example. Bridegroom is just the guy standing next to the bride. There's no other, you know, it's not a, it's not a word that evokes emotion, strong emotion. And I was utterly blown away by the responses I got from all over the world. People um, saying, um, I, I actually jotted a few down. Um, one, one person just said bride. This magical and round word contains dreams and hopes, the project of a life. Youth, fairy, unreal, brightness are words for me that go with it. The same word in French needs just a little accent on the E to make it bride, and that means limited, restrained. For some women, that's the day right after the ceremony. Um, and, and more and more and more, I mean, it just was... Uh, lots of people, one person just said disappointment, vain hopes. Um, <laughs> she, another person said, I know it says bride, but I fleetingly thought it said bade, as in bade farewell, a nice double meaning. And so I just thought I have to, I, I, I have to do something with this because it, and I started researching that very antiquated thing of hope chests and trousseaus. I think in, in Australia it's called a hope chest. Um, where does that come from? You know, that the woman has to make up all this, has to get and embroider and gifts to make this house a home for her husband and all the hopes that are sewn into it. And in my own maternal, as far back as I can go on my maternal line, was a very young um, Dutch orphan in the 1600s who was sent over to South Africa, no doubt to be a bride for somebody stationed here. Um, and so that's that's the child bride is is acknowledging that Ariane, um little ancestor that I now wish I could transport right into my life now and give her a hug and 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 the support that she no doubt never had. Of course, we know that child bride and bride, I mean, child brides still sadly exist in Afghanistan, in in all over the world, Mauritania. We still get children being forcibly married off to much older men, um, mm. and uh, it, it's 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 an endless task for me. Um, the the this yeah, this is the tablecloth, the image there. Um, I had to tear this tablecloth. It was too massive for me to work with. I work on quite a small scale. Um, and most of those stitches are over stained, some of them quite faint, some I stained more. Um, and they became they became blood stains, they became all whatever you want to see in it. My 91-year-old mother, who finds my work confrontational and difficult to deal with, <laughs> she just thinks it's, she says, the rose petals are lovely. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And and that's wonderful, you know. So you can, <laughs> anywhere from blood to, to rose petals to whatever. Um, but I felt a deep connection with... With, with so much, so many women um, while stitching these works. And, and also deliberately, um, I always try to, well, not try to, I can't stitch beautifully, so I stitch badly. And I stitch, <laughs> there's no trying, in, 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 no effort at all. Um, and uh, yeah, to me, it just spoke very deeply. And for the child bride one, I actually asked my granddaughter to write the word bride for me in, in a very childlike handwriting. And that's what I used in the center of, of that one. 
um, because yeah, that is a that is a tragedy that moves me deeply. Child brides. Yeah, um, it's 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 insane. You know the the amount. I I think it's the greatest genocide in the world. You know what women and children go through. Um, and no. the statistics that we're that we're hearing even coming out of you know the, that in South Africa uh, the the rate of, of of gender violence for South African women are five times higher than anywhere else in the world. No. Um, it's almost too hard to comprehend. It's too hard to to process. Um, I, I, I often I feel all of us perhaps sit with this unprocessed. Um, Oh, you know, you don't know where to actually take it, but to work. I mean, and I think that is the compulsion of working and continuing to work because that is where I can put my anger, my sadness, mm. the joys. Also, um, I can't, I can't put it anywhere else. Otherwise, um, you know, I, I, well, I often say it's a good thing I don't own a gun because who knows what I would actually do. <laughs> It is the only place to put it is in the work. Um, uh, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I mean one one does one does wonder then, Mary, for instance, you know, the fact of of that redness coming out in your work um, be, uh, at this stage, um, because and 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 I want to speak to you about. The different um, color periods in your work, uh, and if you could speak to that, because you know you you said you you had a blue a blue period that you started off with, then there's the purple period, and and the purple period is marked by you, Mary, emerging as an avatar, and now there's this red period. And by the way, this is you know very matrix, you know you and fighting with yourself. <laughs> Sophie, who's you, and then there's you, who's you, and then now there's you, who's... Yeah, I'm sorry, I hope there's no children on here, but it's a real mindfuck, Mary, um, in, the, in the absolute best of ways. Um, someday I'd have enough time to, like, really sit down and write about this, but, like, yeah, it's, like, all the Matrix forms put together. Um <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna show uh, some of those slides, but maybe if you could speak to to this progression of of of, of color in the work, um, uh, and and what and maybe what what it means to arrive now at this kind of red phase in your work. Yeah, um, it started with the dream, and the dreams that are dreaming, and the dream dreams that are dreaming, and then it just became like you know like. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, like so just it became a rabbit hole. Um, the blue period, um, I was looking at uh, domesticity, domestic workers, and when I thought of a color that will actually make sense, I looked at um, ooh, the Zionist, uh, the Zionist churches. You know, in South Africa, we have lots of Zionist churches in every corner. They, um, there's, um, there's a church. Um, and for me, it was the idea of praying. And, and, and if, if you notice that figure's eyes are always closed, that's when she, she's praying, that's when she's in a dream, that's when all her, her dream become, becomes a reality. And she's denying you as a viewer. So there's no eye contact because the viewer is not important, but she is. And she's making herself important. Um, and from there, it moved to the purple series. So the purple series, um, unlike the blue series, where I was looking at my uh, the, uh, the maternal figures in my family, the blue series, I was looking at myself. Um, I remember one time I was telling my grandmother about the uh, work that I do. And, um, and she said, well, you're, you're, you're the precious one because um, you are able to you, you are given a platform to tell stories. Unlike her, she wanted to be a, a nurse, but of course, because of, her, um, because of her gender and also her skin color, so there was just a lot of hurdles in her way. Um, so all that, she, all that she did was just dream. And I think the dream uh, idea or concept um, um, extends from, from her. 
And the purple body of work, I was, I, I thought, well, I've been looking at, um, at the women in my family. At some point, I don't want this story to go stale because if you keep on making the same thing over and over again, you as a maker, you'll get bored and people will see that you get bored. So for me, it's always like challenging myself. What's next? Uh, how can I actually, uh, uh, fix the, uh, the, 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 the problems that I created in the other work. How do I actually top that work? So it's just always like a fight uh, within myself. Like how do I better myself? How do I make better work? How do I challenge myself? How do I uh, bring in uh, uh, good concepts in my art making? Um, and I decided to let go of the, of the, of the, of the, of um, the domestic worker. Um, or, uh, or that story. And when I was thinking of the color that will represent me, because now I wanted to look at myself, I thought, well, there's just so many colors in the world. And um, so just through research, I came across the color purple. But this color purple, um, it's just, it's, it's a color that, um, that I thought, that, that, that I came across many years ago, uh, the color purple uh, movie. Uh, with Hoopy Goldberg and Oprah, um, slavery in the South, um, all these women um, in the South, etc. So you guys know the movie. And, and I thought, um, how do I speak of myself? Um, how do I put myself forward? And um, with now a different color. And the color purple um, actually jumped out in that in, 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 in the Western uh, world, uh, if, if in, in the olden days, if someone is clergy or rich, they wear purple robes. And I was like, wow, I like that idea, but it's just at the same time, it's far away from me. It's a, it's a European concept. Um, I need to be closer to me. And of course, in the East, the highest Buddha will wear, uh, will wear, purple, um, will wear purple attire. And then uh, in Africa, I thought of all these ideas, and of course, in America will be that movie. And um, and I came across the 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 um, uh, the purple shall govern the march that happened in in uh, in Cape Town, where people were protesting against apartheid, and the apartheid um, police laced the water cannon, and purple dies. So the idea was to mark these people. So, um, and I was like, wow, actually the idea of marking has been part of the, uh, the DNA or the apartheid DNA of marking people. But at the same time, the color of, resi of uh, resilient, the color of, um, of fighting. And um, so, the, uh, so the figure that represented me or represents me, uh, I decided to make it wear purple. And, um, and yeah, and so it continued. I made a few bodies, oh, um, I made works um, under that series. And at some point, um, I wanted to explore other, other ways now. And I was like, well, the purple has come to an end. It's my fourth year. I need to move to another color. And then I started working uh, with, the, with the red color. And of course, the red color, in a way, I was playing a psychologist. Um, uh, um, and as I, I, I wanted to go deeper and, and, and just ask myself, why are South Africans angry? And I realized mm -hmm. that the black body has been engulfed in, in violence for centuries. The mm -hmm. only life sometimes or in a way that it understands its violence and bring violence to ourselves, other people inflict violence upon us. So it's just violence everywhere. And it's not surprising with what's happening um, right now in the news. Um, so I wanted to explore and, and, and speak of that. And, um, and, and, and that's when I started working on the red and on the red body of work where I'm just looking at um, what makes South Africans angry and where is this anger coming from? And of course, in Isuzulu, um, a, a anger comes in different, in different ways, like in different metaphors, whether it's in temperature, um, meaning that he's so angry, he, he's, um, he, he, he's flaming. Yeah, that, that would be the direct, direct translation. Or you would say, uh, um, he's angry, he has become an animal. Um, or, I mean, a red dog. Or, uh, or he's seeing red, which also in, in English, there is a term that's seeing red. So these terms just, you know, came into the into the work, into my work, and I just started making uh, visual objects out of out of these um, idioms, um, 
uh, mm -hmm. out of these idioms, Onguni idioms. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's 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 so it's so interesting to hear of an uh, you know an artist speak in these terms of of color phases. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's it's very Picasso, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> every Western person. <laughs> <different. laughs> very genius, uh, very. Uh, <laughs> so so final so final question to to each of you. Um, you know, your, your works uh, speak of the immense, you know, reservoirs of resourcefulness that women contain in, in negotiating their lives. You know, your imagery, your characters, your avatars do this, of course. But your practice, your extensive practice speaks of the fact that all of y'all embody this as women artists in, in order to survive just the art field itself. Um, what are some of the inspirations that... Uh, influence you or that you harness in, in, in order to, to sustain yourselves on a daily basis? Mm. Look at them, they weren't expecting this question. Yeah, this is the South Africa portion. Of the <laughs> I just went well too. <laughs> but I didn't ask you what you want, I asked you to stay with you. <laughs> uh, I, I guess as, 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 as an artist you, uh, I would say one is addicted to torture like when you uh, uh, um, when you research but the more you know I think for me like the, I've been the last couple of years I've just been you know like yearning to learn and reading books I just be, I, I'm becoming more and more depressed just you know just being helpless uh, about the world um, when you when you find out like actually this is this stems from that um, mm. you know like no, nothing just happens um, out of the blue there is history behind it and mm. the more you know uh, the more it just becomes just so helpless and um, and yeah and I think I think yeah I don't know what, what, what was the question again what, <laughs> what, what sustains you not what depresses you <laughs> <laughs> oh, life, wow. It's just life. Everything of that like life throws my way, or whatever <laughs> way I see the world. I guess it's yeah. <laughs> it's me to make more work. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, for me, sorry, well, I mean, <laughs> no, 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 go, go through, go through. Um, for me. I, I think obviously the obvious answer is uh, Kali sustains me, right? Um, in spirit, but also in inspiration. I find myself, you know, this point of what Mary said about reading is important because I find myself going back, constantly going back to the kind of mythologies that I'm interested in. And every time I go back to it, um, I find something else that I missed the last time. Um, and I think that's a lot of that has to do with life and life experience and you know the many things that we go through um, and that's the kind of thing that constantly grounds my making um, and, and also pushes me to want to make um, but also I'm inspired by and uh, often when I just need a pick-me-up I listen to dancers speak <laughs> and there's specific dances that i really enjoy and i enjoy their work people like janike rangarajan who who make works about the yoni um using traditional classical sorry traditional is the wrong word classical bharatanatyam uh, but to speak to these issues that then you know start to speak to the kinds of things i'm interested in around patriarchy women's bodies gender-based violence all of these things so for me it's it's uh, looking to other artists for inspiration and grounding uh it's this idea and the spirit of kali uh and meditating <laughs> and dancing uh and reading yeah reading about all of those things and and conversations with other women uh for me are very important other women who inspire me whose work inspires me um and my family my mother especially you know and my my little niece as well i learn a lot from her Especially about what not to wear, what doesn't look good. So <laughs> she grounds me in that way. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I think Mary inadvertently gave me an answer to something I didn't have. Um, um, why I am so, and, and, and it is when she mentioned um, just how despondent she can be and become because of the state of the world and our country and the violence and the violence. Um, and I suddenly thought, oh, that's why I, I like to escape. Uh, and Google was absolutely invented for me into that period between the 12th century and the 16th century, roughly. Um, yeah. Images of the morphology of, of human um, sexual organs. That's when my sons-in-law said to me, safe search on, please. <laughs> but, um, and, and, and plants, because that's where, that's where no knowledge really, like we understand it, existed. It was just this dreamy time of imagining things you know and and you get the the male reproductive organs looking like flowers and the female of uterus obviously also like a plant or it, it's just emerging and i escape into that so often i have files and files and files of these images wow. because i love i love that no knowledge, um, no history. You can just invent it yourself and um, and go from there. So that is hugely um, in, uplifting. That that is to me completely uplifting. Oh. Um, is to reduce all of us to beautiful plants. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's the idea. I think it's the highest life form on on the oh, planet. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's um, funny that you're saying. Yeah. Really, because my, I was I, I always say like you know what. I need to start painting flowers. I'm tired of just. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Start uh, painting plants. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> deeply, deeply healing yeah. and 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 fascinating, endlessly fascinating. Yeah. And they also look like vaginas, you know. I know. Yeah. I mean, it, orchids. Orchids are all about sex. They are yeah. so promiscuous, and um, so it's very, very so. interesting. See, the conversation is just about to end when it's really getting interesting. Stay <laughs> <laughs> so tuned. Thank you. At the point of Georgia O'Keeffe. So we should start a whole Georgia O'Keeffe movement here. Yes. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to say a huge thank you to, to all of you for this fantastic conversation and for, for really what is the gift of your work. Um, because that's, the, that's what it really is. You know, the, your, your, your imaginations allow us to, to traverse uh, time and space and, and other dimensions and possibilities at the same time that they really tussle with the very harsh realities that we deal with. Um, and in, in doing so, it gives us the strength to do so. And so I really want to thank you for that and for, and for opening up uh, to us in this conversation. I also want to say a huge thank you to all of the uh, folks who joined us today uh, for this uh, conversation. I'm afraid we do have to stop. We have people in the UK, in the Netherlands, uh, from Botswana, all parts of South Africa. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you know, without an audience, we wouldn't be able to, we would, we actually, we would be able to have a conversation, but it's great to have people join us for this conversation. So thank you so much for this. And, and really, um, all of you, thank you so much for, for your work. It's, 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 and for making it available for tactile visions. Well, mm. it, it's, it's, it's such an honor to, to, uh, to have had you, uh, as part of this, this exhibition. So thank, thank you, Charlene. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Yeah. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.